hello and welcome to Crime and Court. My name is Heather and this is episode 27, I can't believe we're on 27, of the Karen Reed uh, Commonwealth versus Karen Reed trial. This is, of course, she is on trial for the potentially, but she didn't, unalive her boyfriend. Um, and she's obviously being set up and there's just, there's no other way around it. There aren't two sides to this story. It is Karen's side, but I digress. All right. So we are going to go, um, I'm going to do, I have a lot of little updates for you. So it's going to, I'm going to try to go in quick succession and, uh, get these in for you. So, um, at least in an efficient and timely manner. So. Uh, before I dive in, please hit that like button and make sure you're subscribed for future episodes on the Canton cover-up or other uh, cases regarding corruption and cover-ups because it's not just in Canton. All right, let's begin. So I want to play, first I want to play this little, it, it's a very quick news clip. It's going to give us an update on jury selection Jury selection is um, still underway in the Karen Reed case. They have well over the 16, which was the original number of uh, juries, uh, seated jurors that they wanted. However, they are now at 19. But uh, this is the beginning of, uh, so let me give you the date. I am recording this at the morning of Wednesday, April 24th. So at this moment in time, there have been 19 jurors selected. The court decided she wants 20, which is unheard of. So she wants 20 jurors. And uh, so we're going to see one more today. Hopefully it gets done in a rather timely manner. And then we can go about our day. She, uh, Judge Canoni wanted to do this, I guess, because it's going to be a longer case and it's so high profile and they just want to make sure that you know they have coverage in case people need to drop out uh, they'll I think she said she'll eventually wean it down to 16 however um, that's where we're at now so uh, we're going to try to select one more juror today and then tomorrow Thursday the 25th is a court day and any outstanding hearings which we're also going to talk about are going to be ruled upon or whatever by Judge Canoni. So we'll, um, I'm trying to give you updates on everything that's happening right now. Plus we've got Turtle Boy and all sorts of things going on. So here, let's watch this little clip and then um, we'll get on to the next topic. Commonwealth identify themselves for the record. Morning, well, have you ever heard of 19 jurors in a court case? Well, 19 people have been selected as jurors for the murder trial of Karen Reed, but it's still not enough. And it's all because of how this case has divided the community. WBZ's Tammy Mutasa explains this unusual step. This jury selection process has been dragging on, but hopefully things will wrap up on Wednesday. But experts say this case is going to be about credibility. So finding impartial jurors is very important, no matter how long it takes. One week from today, Karen Reed could finally hear the opening statements in her trial for the murder of her boyfriend, Boston police officer John O'Keefe. And I don't know why this was... I guess released a day ago from CBS Boston. However, that would be Tuesday and her trial will most likely start next Monday is what they're saying. So the 20, is it the 29th? Yeah, the 29th is what they're saying. April 29th is when opening statements may start. Because like I said, uh, today they're going to get one more juror. Thursday, they have a few more motions to go through, and then there's no court on Friday, so that would lead us to Monday. So, opening statements Monday. Reed's defense team certainly ready to get things going. Of course, we've been ready. But only when jury selection is finally finalized. So far, 19 jurors have been seated. Attorneys say the judge 
wants to see 20 potential jurors so that up to four can be dismissed if any problems come up. I think it's fairly unusual to have 20 jurors and with the idea of winnowing it down to 16, but everything about this case has been pretty unusual. On Monday, 91 potential jurors were interviewed. About 78 had heard or discussed the case. 32 already had an opinion on it, and 13 felt biased toward one side or the other. Law experts say while the selection process has stretched for two weeks, it's for good reason. In the meantime, both sides are looking to settle some issues before trial. Like, will Norfolk District Attorney Michael Morrissey be required to testify? Innuendo is not evidence. The defense has him on their witness list, claiming he will testify about a conflict Canton Police had with the investigation. Reed supporters have blamed Morrissey for missteps in the investigation. But prosecutors say other witnesses will testify that Canton Police removed themselves from the case because of a family relationship with witnesses. So at the end of trial, 12 jurors will actually be randomly selected out of that group of 20 people, and they will decide Reed's fate. In Dedham, Tammy Mutasa, WBZ News. All right, so that is... Uh, that's that. <laughs> so really quickly, um, they did talk about something regarding Michael Morrissey wanting to go on the stand. We're going to get into his motion later about that. But first, um, so I thought it would be kind of appropriate to go over. I have so many windows and things open here. All right. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, switch my screen there okay so I thought it would be appropriate to go over the jury questions because these have been released um, so this is what every potential juror is going to be asked once um, or this is I'm sure all of them have to fill this out so let's just go through it real quick so number one oh, so it's, first of all the um, Oh, it says don't include your name, just your juror number. So it's really anonymous. All right. And um, so every answer is going to be yes, no, or not sure. Number one, it is alleged that on January 29th, 2022, while intoxicated and operating her motor vehicle in Canton, Massachusetts, the defendant Karen Reed ended her boyfriend, John O'Keefe, an off-duty police officer's life. If there is there, sorry, is there any anything about the description of this case, the charges, or that the victim was an off-duty police officer that cause you that causes you to believe that you cannot be fair and impartial in this case? Number two, do you have opinions regarding previous experiences as a juror, the fairness of the jury system or criminal justice system, or in our country that would impair your ability to be fair and impartial to both the commonwealth and to the defendant so like if for instance you have a bias towards um the defense just because they've been arrested so you feel like okay well they've probably done it the cops probably knew what they were doing the jury you know the, the court system works and it's just going to weed out the bad people well it doesn't always do that until the good people get trampled on and that's um, why we got to prevent things like this from happening again. All right. Um, number three. Do you have any religious or philosophical beliefs that would make it difficult for you to follow the law and come to a verdict in this case? Like maybe if it was a DP case, for instance, like if you were really religious and you didn't believe in the DP because of that, all right, so number four, reports about this case have been publicized in the media. Do you think that you have read, seen, heard, or discussed anything about the case from any source? Number five, this case is expected to garner a significant amount of media attention. Is there anything about the high-profile nature of this case that would prevent you from serving as a fair and impartial juror? Number six, have you already started to make up your mind about this case? Number seven, do you, any family members or close friends reside in or conduct regular business in Canton, Massachusetts? Number eight, 
Is there any reason you would be unable to follow an instruction that during your jury during your jury service, you may not read any news or media accounts about this case, watch or listen to any media or news broadcasts or commentary about this case, discuss this case with anyone, research or look into any look into this case up on the internet or perform independent research. That would be the hardest part for me is not to do my own independent research. I think I would want to go and look up everything I could find. (laughs) I would never be on a jury. All right. Number nine. Is there any reason you would be unable to follow an instruction that during your jury service, you may not read or view any social media articles, posts, videos, podcasts, or any other non-traditional media platforms that may discuss this case? Number 10, is there any reason that if you are independently exposed to outside influence or media about this case, you would be unable to follow an instruction that you must report an exposure to the court through the court officer? So if someone accidentally uh, starts talking to you about the case and giving you opinions, why is that so far or close to my head? <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, where was I? So if anybody starts to talk to you about this case, would you report it right away? Or if you overhear something in your like break room and you know, you overhear somebody talking about it. All right. Number 11, would you automatically believe or disbelieve law enforcement, firefighters, or first responders simply because of their occupation? Do you have any strong personal beliefs or have you been exposed to any strong personal beliefs from friends and relatives about law enforcement officers, prosecutors, or the government? 13. Have you ever been involved in a group, community, or individual activity such as a march, a demonstration, or a financial contribution showing support for law enforcement in or outside your own community? That's a good question, because that would show that you are very, very, very pro law enforcement. And you, Karen Reed would probably not want that. Well, I don't know, because if you are pro law enforcement, I mean, you might be, you might hate, you have biases towards Karen Reed, and that's not right. All right. Anyway, so 14, have you ever been involved in a group, community, or individual activity such as a march, demonstration, or financial contribution that was critical of the police or law enforcement in or outside of your community? So any one of the free Karen Reed supporters that stand out there with their banners would have to say yes. Have you or someone close to you ever had education, training, or work experience in any of the following fields? Law enforcement, military, alcohol, and drug abuse, domestic violence. Number 16, do you have any strong personal beliefs or have you been exposed to any strong personal beliefs from friends and relatives about operating a motor vehicle under the influence of alcohol? Because that is one of her charges. Have you ever been involved in a group organization, participa- participated in a march, demonstration, campaign, or donated money on behalf of an organization or cause that was against driving under the influence of alcohol, such as SAD, Students Against Drunk Driving, or MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving? Number 18, has anyone close to you ever been involved in an incident involving drinking and driving? If so, would you experience, would that experience prevent you from being a fair and impartial juror in that case, in this case? Number 19, have you or has anyone close to you been involved in or witnessed a motor vehicle crash? Number 20, is there anything about crash reconstruction testimony that would make it difficult for you to be fair or impartial in this case. Number 21, have you or any family members or close friends been involved in a DV relationship that featured physical, mental, and or verbal abuse? Have you ever been a victim of a violent crime? During trial, you will hear about medical treatment, death, and 
review of graphic autopsy photographs, will that affect your ability to participate in a fair and impartial juror? As a fair and impartial juror. You may, uh, number 24, you may find a defendant guilty based on circumstantial evidence, but you cannot find a defendant guilty based on speculation, guesswork, or surmise. Is it difficult for you to understand the differences between circumstantial evidence, speculation, guesswork, and surmise? Number 25, do you believe Karen Reed should prove her innocence? Number 26, if the defendant doesn't testify, do you think that she is probably guilty or hiding something? And that it's amazing to me that people still have that bias. That if somebody doesn't testify or somebody doesn't just speak out and say something about their innocence, then they don't understand your right to remain silent. Because once you start to talk, your right goes away. All right, so do you recognize anyone you ha do you know or recognize anyone you have seen today in the courthouse or the jury pool <coughs> excuse me my throat always gets dry all right number 28 would your answers to any of the above questions be embarrassing or damaging if disclosed publicly or would disclo disclosure infringe on your privacy and number 29, do you have any concerns about your personal privacy due to presence of media cameras in the courtroom and or highly publicized nature of this course case? Sorry. So those were the jury questions. Each juror would be asked um, to fill out this questionnaire. And from there, they, uh, the attorneys are allowed to ask additional follow-up questions regarding their answers and then that's how they weed out their people who they feel will be the least biased in this case or may have uh, the the least amount of knowledge about this case so that is jury questions next I wanted to go over the Commonwealth's response to the defendants motion so we in my last stream i think it was the last stream we went over um the motion for karen sorry I'm trying to make it bigger so you guys can see it better um so we went over a motion that karen put forth so that she could um, have the jurors face to face see the um the witness because um, as I showed you in the last stream I'm going to pop it up on the screen this would be the view from at least six different jurors have like a, a similar view to at least up to where they're parallel to him because these seats and the way this courthouse is designed is the witness seat is all the way up there while the juror box starts um, further back so they're the people in this case are the most the most important people in this case are the jurors because they are the finders of fact and if you are hiding jurors from being able to see the witness's face that's a big problem and this courthouse has been around forever <laughs> and they've been doing trial this way for who knows how long and it should uh, it's it's amazing that no one's brought it up until now so um they put in a motion to say we need to rearrange some jury seats or we need to find some kind of solution so here is the commonwealth's response and their way to remedy said obstruction of view or whatever however you call it but poor view of the witness All right, so now comes the Commonwealth in response to the defendant's motion raising a perceived constitutional challenge to courtroom management issues regarding the location of seated jurors in relation to witnesses who are called to testify. Specifically, the defendant claims that the juror, the view of jurors seated in seats 9, 10, 11, and 12 violates her constitutional so four that's four seeds violates her constitutional right to confront witnesses sorry um 
I thought it was six. That's what I heard on Melanie, Attorney Melanie Little stream. It's probably six seats because they would be, you know, one back from the other. So, or, you know, two rows. So I would assume that there were, okay, my dog needs her blanket, of course. Right when I start streaming, she's like, I'm cold. <laughs> Sorry, you guys don't need to see this view. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come here. Come here. I know I can't reach you over the computer. There you go. There you go. Okay. She's happy now. I think she's still not seated. She takes forever to sit. Guys, this is so annoying. Sit down. <laughs> Lay down, Hazel. Oh my goodness, she spins herself around and I don't know what she does. I'm sorry about that. She is high maintenance. She's a high maintenance dog. I don't even know where it was. All right, so there, there's likely two rows of juror seats. And um, so the seats behind those will probably also be obstructed or poor view poor sight of the witness so these uh this is um this view of the jurors or lack thereof violates her constitutional right to confront witnesses see defendants exhibit a the defendant's right of confrontation requires the physical presence of a witness testifying against him or her the witness's testimony to be under oath the defendant's opportunity to cross-examine the witness and the jury's opportunity to observe the witness's demeanor. The defendant challenges only the jury. So this is coming from the Commonwealth. So th those were the defendant's reasons. Why? But now here comes the Commonwealth saying the defendant challenges only the jury's opportunity to observe the witness's demeanor. Demeanor is defined as, quote, behavior towards others, outward manner, end quote. So they got that from Mary. Yeah, see Miriam Webster's dictionary demeanor. There's probably multiple, multiple meanings for demeanor and their outward manner, I would contest that that is your body language and all the all the little things that come with it. And for the jury not to see that, that's a problem. So they, they basically are shooting themselves in the foot by giving this definition. So I don't know how. And okay, so the demeanor is defined as behavior towards others, outward manner, and includes more than just facial expressions. See Webster's Dictionary. Demeanor is an outward behavior. It's the way a witness stands or sits, the manner in which they speak, their body language, their tone of voice, and their verbal and physical responses to questions, which they're not going to be able to see those jurors seated in those seats. They're not going to be able to see that. A lot of that, according to this definition that Morris, uh, Morrissey, Lolly, whoever's putting this out I don't know um whichever one doesn't matter what is it Michael Morrissey so yes he is saying that this is he's giving that definition Morrissey but yet he doesn't see that that proves Karen Reed's case that we want to see all of these things not just some, but they should be able to look at all of those things. And if their vision is the back of the guy's head, that's their view, they're not going to be able to see. They're missing a ton of stuff. You can't determine body language from the back of someone's head. All right, so jurors seated in the four challenge seats can observe the behavior, demeanor, side profiles of a testifying witness's face and are within approximately four to six feet from the witness stand. The Norfolk Superior Court was built in 1827 and criminal trials have been conducted in the main session courtroom with substantially the same setup for over 100 years. Well, then you've been doing it wrong for 100 years is what that, that tells me. 
The Norfolk Superior main session room or courtroom is also the largest courtroom in Norfolk, so they're going to suggest a smaller courtroom. The Commonwealth's initial suggestion to satisfy the defendant's concern was to position the witness's seat or instruct the witness to position their body to face the jury box while also, while also remaining in view of the defendant. As long as the witness is physically present in the courtroom, the witness is not required to look at the defendant. Okay, well, that doesn't matter. The defendant still has a right to look at the witness. The witness doesn't have to look, but the defendant has to be able to see the witness. Uh, per permissible for witness to sit at 45 degree angle from defendant where defendant could see witnesses profile and lips. Okay, so that was whatever ruling this kind of fray commonwealth and tufts all right so videotaped testimony permissible where defendant could see witnesses by bending slightly uh, okay the defendant's motion indicates that ms reed was already proposed has already proposed an alternative seating arrangement which will allow both ms reed and all members of the jury to the ability to observe witnesses who testify at trial the suggestion posed by the defendant was to move jurors' chairs to the other end of the jury box. However, as explained by the court, the jury box contained 12 seats in, at the time of the suggestion, and whereas 16 jurors, now it's 20, will be seated for this trial, that space would be occupied by the additional four seated jurors. Given the defendant's occupation, the I'm sorry, not occupation, <laughs> given the, the defendant's objection. The Commonwealth offers another alternative that the trial be conducted in courtroom 25 of the Norfolk Superior Court, while a smaller courtroom trial, uh, courtroom trials are often conducted in courtroom 25, and as detailed in Attorney Yannetti's supplemental affidavit, he previously conducted a trial within this courtroom and during trial had ample opportunity to observe the positioning of the box vis-a-vis -vis the witness stand, as well as positioning of the witness stand vis-a-vis -vis the defendant. I, Attorney Yannetti, observed that every member of the jury in that courtroom could clearly see the witness's face while testifying. I also observed that the witness was facing the defendant. See paragraph 8 of Supplemental Affidavit of Counsel in support of Defendant Reed's motion to enforce her constitutional right to face-to-face -face confrontation. And that was signed Michael Morrissey, District Attorney... Also, Adam Lally and Laura McLaughlin are on there. So that is their response. Let's just move it to a smaller courtroom, even though we already know that our courtroom is going to fill up in two seconds. The big one. <laughs> um, and we need the room for media and the additional 20 jurors, or, you know, the 20 jurors as opposed to 16. So you need the, the room. You need the bigger room. You need to find a... a a better solution to just moving rooms or making the witness sit diagonally. I don't know. That's my opinion anyways. So is this my next thing I was going to talk about? It's, I have an outline. I'm here looking. Okay. So speaking of Michael Morrissey and his, let's just go to a smaller courtroom because we don't want eyes on us looking at all of our Misconduct. Here is a motion from Morrissey again. This is the Commonwealth's motion for offer of proof prior to defendants calling or summonsing the Norfolk District Attorney and the victim witness advocate as witnesses and request for an order that neither is subject to sequ sequestration. And I can't say that word. Okay, sequestration. Just doesn't feel right. All right. <laughs> so the Commonwealth basically they don't want Michael Morrissey to have to, number one, testify. Number two, since he's on the witness list, he has to be sequestered, him and this victim, the victim witness advocate. They don't want these people sequestered. And basically, they don't want Morrissey to have to testify because um, he he literally did make himself a witness in this case by his statement in August by saying 
that um, he, he that he basically was attesting to the facts of the case, which he can't do as a district attorney. He's not supposed to speak about the facts of the case or you know crucify Karen to the public. He basically you know told everybody she was guilty you know, and um, all the other people are innocent and you should believe him. And he has more credibility because he's the district attorney. So people do believe it. So that's a big problem. And it, it taints the jury there, jury pool. All right. So here now comes the Commonwealth and moves that this court order that the defendant make a satisfactory offer of proof prior to calling and or summoning Norfolk District Attorney Michael W. Morrissey and victim witness advocate Stephen Nelson as witnesses and for a finding that the district attorney and the advocate, Mr. Nelson, are not subject to any order of sequestration. On August 15th, 2024, the defendant listed both the district attorney and the victim witness advocate as potential defense witnesses. When a defendant resorts to the extraordinary means of calling a prosecutor as a witness, he must make a satisfactory offer of proof as to the need for testimony from the prosecutor. It's according to Commonwealth versus Blakey. And um, in, in enforcement of subpoena, I don't know. All right, so generally, witness... What does it say? Generally, witness was has burden of showing why the subpoena should not be enforced. A prosecutor, sh I feel like I'm not loud enough. Uh, a prosecutor should be called only where there is a showing that the prosecutor's testimony is relevant, material, and not cumulative. See the case before. Uh, defendant failed to show that prosecutor had personal knowledge of relevant factors bearing on officer credibility that should not be elicited by other means. The same principles hold true for the advocate. See Commonwealth versus Bing Saul Ling. Witness advocate or the victim witness advocate is member of prosecution team and notes discoverable or protected by work product rule to the same extent as prosecutor notes. Um, but it's still discoverable, so they should still be able, I mean, they should still be able to ask questions. All right, District um, Attorney Michael Morrissey is the elected official of the Norfolk District, a position he has, he was first elected to in 20, 2010, so he's been in here a while. The district attorney is the elected advocate of the people and chief law enforcement officer from the Norfolk district. Um, district attorney is the people's elected advocate for a broad spectrum of societal interests from ensuring that criminals are punished from wrong for wrongdoing to allocating limited resources to maximize public protection. Um, Okay, why are you telling us what a district attorney is? I mean, a district attorney is not someone who goes out and speaks to the credibility of witnesses and evidence in a particular case to the media. That's what a district attorney is not. And that's more important than what a district attorney is at this moment. I mean, I don't know why he's arguing you know what I'm saying? I don't know. All right. So on uh, April 18th, 2024 at sidebar during jury impanelment, defense counsel made an insufficient showing of why district attorney Morrissey's testimony would be necessary to their defense. Defense counsel indicated they would call district attorney Morrissey to testify about the conflict the Canton Police Department had with the investigation and the assignment of the detective unit of the Massachusetts State Police assigned to the Norfolk District Attorney's Office. I like how they put conflict in quotes, like there is no conflict here, but there is a huge, 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 huge conflict of interest, and we all know it, and it's getting old now. 
there, but we're, we didn't do anything wrong. We're the Commonwealth and you should just believe us. And we're being victimized now by this person who uh, we're framing, <laughs> basically. All right, so it is not in dispute that pursuant to statute, the district attorney and its law enforcement officers have exclusive jurisdiction over all death investigations in Norfolk County. Further, other witnesses are expected to testify that the Canton Police Department has disassociated themselves from the investigation due to a familial relationship between the homeowner and the Canton Police. And that is very well good and and right that they can get that in through other witnesses, but other witnesses didn't make a public statement vouching for the people in this case and publicly crucifying Karen. Mr. Nelson is an employee of the Norfolk District Attorney's Office, so this is the victim advocate, and is the assigned victim uh, witness advocate in this case and has been assigned to the case since January 2022. Um, uh, Okay, so a victim's bill of rights generally requires the staff of district attorneys to ensure that victims and witnesses are afforded such rights. But that doesn't mean that you, they have, it doesn't, that right there doesn't mean that the defense can't question them. Like, I don't understand. You're giving, require staff of the district attorneys to ensure that victims and witnesses are afforded such rights. Okay. Well, you can have your rights, but that doesn't mean that we can't call you to the stand if we've got questions. The victim advocates serve as an important and solitary, uh, salutary function. They provide victims, witnesses, and family members needed assistance, information, and support, and generally help them to cope with the realities of the criminal justice system and the disruption of personal affairs attending a criminal prosecution during a time of personal trauma. So I guess they're the back and forth in between the district attorney's office and John O'Keefe's family, for instance, is what I'm, I'm taking this as. All right, so during trial, it is especially important that the advocate engage in the essential function of acting as liaison between victims and witnesses and the district attorney's office. So yeah, there you go. That is what they do. Neither the district attorney nor the advocate were percipient witnesses to the charges before this court to the extent the defense. So again, percipient witness means like you observed it with your own senses. So it is true that Michael Morrissey may not have witnessed things with his own senses, but he has made public claims saying Colin Albert was not in the house. How does he know that? He's made himself a witness by saying that. So, and many other things that he said in that message, which we've gone over many times in my channel. And Ma- attorney Melanie Little just went over it last night in her previous stream too. So it is out there. We've all gone over it. All, a lot of us content creators have gone over it because it's, it's bad. All right. So anyways, I mean, like entertainment wise, it's good, but <laughs> it's bad for a uh, district attorney to do. So they were not percipient witnesses. No. To the extent the defendant may want to impeach proposed Commonwealth witnesses as to statements, the defendant has not shown the absence of alter- alternate sources of said purported information. Further, to the extent the defendant is seeking either the dis- district attorney or the advocate's opinions or observations regarding witnesses, mental impressions, research, or evaluation of the evidence for the Norfolk County case, such areas of inquiry reflect privileged work product. Whoops, what happened? It just took me to another page. Um, I'm sorry, where did that go? Privileged work product. I just lost my spot. Like it just shrunk. Did you guys see that? Privileged work product here. Okay. So 
Work product rules exempt from discovery those portions of records, reports, correspondence, memoranda, or internal documents of the adverse party, which are only the legal research opinions, theories, and conclusions of the adverse parties or its attorneys and legal staff. Okay, so you have work product that we you're exempt from turning over, but there's still information that this... Um, advocate might know I wonder why they call the advocate I wonder what you know maybe the advocate or district attorney's office is telling the witness or the victim something or maybe it has to do with the victims the witnesses in the uh turtle boy how they're victims of Turtle Boy and Karen Reed and now you know maybe they're trying to make them victims also in this case or something I don't know I don't know why you would call the victims advocate but they they must have a reason because obviously you don't just call somebody with no reason all right so the Norfolk District Attorney's Office respectfully requests that the court order that, per, that prior to calling or summonsing the district attorney and advocate, the defendant make a satisfactory offer of proof before this court and that this court find that they are not subject to any order of re- sequestration. I can't say that word. Sorry. All right. So this was also signed. Michael Morrissey, Adam Lally, and McLaughlin are McLaughlin, McLaughlin. I don't know how to say it. They are also on there. So that is an update on that. What do you guys think regarding the Norfolk district attorney trying to back out of being a witness? I mean, we all knew this was going to come. I have a feeling Bev's going to grant it just because she's Bev. But I hope that this means that they can do like a proffer or something with Morrissey, maybe tomorrow when they're doing their hearings. Although I doubt it because Morrissey is not going to want to be on camera doing a proffer. But it might be something that they have to do to get information and to determine whether they can bring him to trial as a witness so I don't know I'm here for it though I really hope they call him I would love to hear him testify as to why he made all of those statements and uh you know attested to the innocence of certain people and the guilt of others when you're not supposed to do that you're supposed to be neutral as a prosecutor uh all right so anyways the last oh no I have two more topics I wanted to talk about. First, the buffer zone. I wanted to do an update on the buffer zone. So here is the actual buffer zone. We've never read it on this channel. So we're going to read through it. And then um, basically, I bring this up because so the buffer zone is continuing now. It's in place. The buffer zone. Originally, the Commonwealth wanted a 500 foot buffer zone and Bev Canoni said, well, I see your buffer zone, but I'm only going to give you 200 feet. So she she gave him 200 feet around the courthouse and complexes. So let's read this. The buffer zone court order for Commonwealth versus the Reed trial. The trial court has issued the following order effective for the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed trial, which begins tomorrow with jury selection. So this was issued on the 15th. All right, so court order. It is hereby ordered that no individual may demonstrate in any manner, including carrying signs or placards within 200 feet of the courthouse complex during trial at this case, unless otherwise ordered by this court. This complex includes the Norfolk Superior Courthouse building and the parking area behind the Norfolk County Registry of Deeds building. Individuals are also prohibited from using audio enhancing devices while protesting. So no bullhorns across the street. We want you as silent as possible. We want you as hidden as possible. We don't like your message. So get back. That is what Judge Canoni and the Commonwealth have done. And they have basically crapped all over the First Amendment. That's what they did. 
All right, it is further ordered that no individuals will be permitted to wear or exhibit any buttons, photographs, clothing, or insignia relating to the case pending against the defendant or relating to any trial participant in the courthouse during the trial. So they can't picket in the 200 feet zone and they cannot wear any of their anything supporting one way or the other inside the courthouse. So that doesn't mean that they can't wear it in front of the courthouse, but it, it just, okay, law enforcement officers who are testifying, oh, that's something separate. Law enforcement officers who are testifying or are members of the audience are also prohibited from wearing their department issued uniforms and any police emblems in the courthouse. So yeah, all that part right there is put in place to hide the fact or at least give a reason as to why there are no law enforcement supporting Brian Albert, Michael Proctor, all these people who the, the Karen Reed conspiracy side is accusing of being crooked. There's no one there supporting them. And there's a reason. It's because the people on the inside know and they're either scared or they just don't want to show sides because there's the people in this town, the, the McAlberts have way too much power in this town. And apparently the DA, you know, there's so much corruption underlying within the DA's office, Judge Canoni. It's all just bleeding through this case. And I can't believe that it's still going to trial. I still am baffled. I'm still baffled. But yet we're here talking about jury selection. We just read the question, so we know it exists. <laughs> All right, so the courthouse steps, they should be able to wear their Karen Reed stuff. They just can't assemble there, is what this this reading says to me. However, they've taken it as far as you can't even, you know, the people that are out there are not going to risk going to jail for 60 90 days like turtle boy just for wearing a turtle pin a turtle boy pin or a free karen reed sign shirt as they walk by so you know that's what that is so this is um oh i wanted to reread the first amendment we've read it here on my channel before it's really not difficult to understand but yet the Commonwealth seems to have a hard time with this. So this is the Constitution of the United States First Amendment goes like this. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peacefully, peacefully, to protest, to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And I highlighted that particular air, you know, the, the parts that I highlighted on the screen, abridging the freedom of speech, I'd say they are doing that, they are trying to keep the freedom of speech quieted, no bullhorns, we don't want to hear you. We don't want to see you around our court steps and, um, well, press. I mean, come on. Aiden Carney has been reporting on this story for a year and they locked him up for being too effective at his job, as he likes to say. He was too effective at his job of uncovering this stuff and reporting on it. And it got to be this huge sensation now and it's cats out of the bag you can't put it back so they can lock turtle boy up but it just shows their corruption just is bleeding off of them again the corruption and the cover-up it's all there all right so yeah so the freedom of press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble uh yeah she's doing all of these things and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. They are out there because they are angry at their government. And that, that is what it comes to.
Speaking of reasons to be angry at your government, Turtle Boy's charges. Turtle Boy. Oh, wait. That was a really great transition. But before I do move on, um, there. so the Supreme Court actually did request a briefing from the individuals who have taken this up and appealed the the buffer zone um, ordinance that uh, Kanoni put in. So they want to hear it and they put in an emergency briefing. So they wanted to hear it by, I think, t- t- Monday or Tuesday. It was Monday or Tuesday. I think Monday. They wanted it re- turned in. So now we are supposed to be getting, I think, some kind of answer in response to that, or at least um, something soon. So hopefully um, that whole 200 ban thing can be out the door because it is an infringement on our First Amendment rights. Kanoni knows that. The Commonwealth knows that. How they've gotten away with it, I don't know. Uh, Because there's no one policing them. That's the problem. No one's holding them accountable. And that is a huge issue we need accountability for Kanoni, for the Commonwealth, for Morrissey, for Lolly, for all of these people, for Mello. Let's get into that. So that's a good transition. Let's get into attorney Ken Mello, the special prosecutor in the Turtle Boy case. So he chose not to show up to court today or yesterday. He Turtle Boy had a hearing about his charges. Um, it's basically just it keeps getting extended because Ken Mello's is not turning over the discovery that they need in this case to even write their briefing to drop the charges. Because we all know that these charges are bogus. Turtle Boy, they used a, a completely inappropriate and inconstitu- an unconstitutional statute to charge Turtle Boy in the first place. And then, I mean, they weaponized it completely to charge Turtle Boy, to charge um, the F- Canton 9 to charge anybody that wants to speak out in this case and to keep you away from the courthouse steps as well. So it's definitely a matter of silencing. So Mello um, has continually been, um, what's the word, like obstructing justice. (laughs) He's not turning over the discovery. They've been asking for it. They were told to give it multiple times and, you know, they just haven't. So this discovery that doesn't exist or is unconstitutional to be used using in the first place, they use a grand jury to indict him. So we don't know the information. The grand jury minutes have been turned over to Karen Reed's defense team somehow, but they didn't get it to get to Tim Bradle, Turtle Boy's attorney, the one who's trying the case. So, um, yeah. So these grand jury minutes, they're still waiting on and whatever else Discovery Mello has not turned over. And Mello, like I said, did not show up to court today. He did a Zoom, like he came to the Zoom feeding or feed and um, claimed he was really sick and struggling and whatnot and he couldn't meet deadlines and blah, 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 you know, whatever lame excuses he has for his not meeting deadlines because he never wants to meet deadlines when it matters. Um, so he's just, he's holding on to the discovery is what it really appears to be. So I'm going to actually, let's swip, swip, switch it over so it's bigger here and I'm going to let you see um, the post hearing of Tim Bradle and Turtle Boy from yesterday's hearing, meaning yesterday, April 23rd. They had a hearing regarding the witness intimidation charges, and here is their statement. By the way, this is from uh, Tom CPU's feed. He's awesome, amazing. I love to watch his feeds anytime there's standouts in front of the courthouse or 200 feet from the courthouse steps. (laughs) Um, I like to watch his streams and he always, you know, you get updates from the people that go inside the courtroom and they come out and they'll tell you like, oh, well, you know, Mello's sick again and didn't come, you know. So you'll get feed uh, um, updates regarding the case during his feeds, which are great. Anyways, just wanted to give a shout out to him. So, um, 
speaking, since it is um, outside, they're speaking outside, it was a windy day yesterday, so you might get some feedback, and there are kids and other people like talking and screaming, plus Aiden had a heckler as well, so you're going to see, <laughs> I don't even want to say his name, but someone came to heckle Turtle Boy. Here we go. Now what? Now what do we do now? Well, yeah, absolutely. So they're going to be interviewed by this Boston 10, I think it is. Okay. Land 7. Yeah, typical of what we've been dealing. Uh, as Attorney Bradle said, obfuscation is the word. This is intentional. Uh, they are trying to delay this as long as possible so they can keep me on bail, so they can try to jam me up on something again. That's the whole purpose of this. They have absolutely no intention of bringing me to trial because they know this case can't exceed on the uh, succeed on the merits. Exactly. So literally just keep you know running out the clock and, and, and keeping me on thin ice by having these uh, you know. Having and making Turtle Boy have to continually come back to court all these times with his attorney. It costs money to have your attorney show up, of course, you know, and so it's just trying to drain Turtle Boy of his will to want to keep, you know, going at this. So, uh, they suck. The Commonwealth sucks. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, it's typical. I can only imagine what Karen Reed's going through on a much larger scale than this. But, you know, I've been accusing the Commonwealth of doing this to Karen Reed for quite some time. And then they proved my point to me by arresting me for that and doing the same thing to me. So they're literally proving my point. Um, Attorney Mello was healthy enough to come to court on March 14th because he got giddy about the idea of sending me back to jail for 120 days. That, he's like the kid that is healthy enough to go to school on spree day, but isn't healthy when there's a quiz. And that's what he does. He, he just doesn't want to come to school. He doesn't want to do his job when it's time to do his job, but he wants to do his job when there's a chance that I could get locked up for it. So it's very convenient, And uh, but I'm glad that the judge held him accountable, put a hard deadline of, of, of May 8th, two weeks from now. We need all this discovery. Uh, you know, we've read the grand jury minutes, but there's all these uh, you know, presentations of the grand jury minutes. We don't know what they showed these people. We don't know if the grand jury... Mm, so they're waiting on the discovery of the exhibits now. So they have the grant... Well, at least they've seen the grand jury minutes. I don't know if Mello turned them over or not. But um, they def they've seen them. They just don't know what all the exhibits are that they're referring to and how to combat that. You know, they need all of the information to be able to address it he was lied to, if, if they were deceived, if they were misled, we don't know anything. So uh, we're, we're waiting for all that. And, and uh, what are they hiding? Why, why can't they just give it to us? Um, you feel like you've been in the dark for a while. Yeah, right? we're, we, we, want them, we just want them to comply with the rules. You know, we're sick of being in the dark, sick of the delay. Uh, you know, it was good today that uh, Judge Cahill held them accountable and uh, put some hard deadlines. And uh, we're going to get to justice. You know, the wheels move slowly, but they're, going, they're moving, and they're going in the right direction. So we're, we're very gratified about that. What exactly is it that you're looking for? Obviously, more discovery that you've been asking for. So, so you know, as we've been saying, this case is, is unprecedented. It's a, it's, a, it's a trashing of the First Amendment. Uh, we want to file a motion to dismiss. We can't file a motion to dismiss until uh, the Commonwealth complies with their obligations and gives us the discovery uh, so that we can look at it and uh, confirm. This seems to be a common theme in both Turtle Boy and Karen Reed that they just can't turn over their discovery even when they're compelled to do it. Um, so who's the one that's hiding the truth here? You got to look and see, you know, with your eyes what's going on. I mean, I think so many people are waking up to this and it's not just Canton. This stuff can happen in any town USA. What we already know, basically, which is that this whole prosecution is bogus and it's a violation of the First Amendment, and uh, we're going to make it right. Uh, we want to file that motion to, to dismiss as soon as we can, and we're getting prejudiced by this delay, and uh, we think this is intentional uh, to Absolutely. keep Mr. Carney away from the Karen Reed case, to keep the sort of Damocles over his head, and, uh, you know, uh, it benefits them, and we're... 
we're not going to put up with that anymore. We're going to get our discovery. You mentioned Karen Reed's case. You got some documents, discovery, whatever it might be. Before you did, is that correct? Yeah, correct? unbelievable. I've never seen this in 30 years. We're waiting for our grand jury minutes, and I happen to look at the discovery uh, notices from the Karen Reed case, and I see that my grand jury minutes that should be in my file cabinet, where are, which are nowhere to be found, are already given to the Karen Reed defense team in that case. So how does that happen? I would have liked to have an explanation as to how they get my grand jury minutes before I do. I've never seen that one before. And if that's not a smoking gun to show that they're intentionally delaying this case, I don't know what is. Can you confirm you knew Ken Mello was in the hospital, please? Oh, come on. Any other real journalists want to say Oh, you're <laughs> That was Grant Smith Ellis. We've talked about him before. He asked whatever the dumb question that was. And he was like, yeah, only uh, real journalists. <laughs> Let's watch that again. It was fun. Hospital, please. Intentionally delaying this case. I don't know what is. Can you confirm you knew Ken Mello was in the hospital, please? Oh, come on. Any other real journalists want to say Oh, you're a How embarrassing is that? Everybody laughed. Because they all know you're not a realist, real journalist, Grant. That's why. I think so. I think he'll be, I think he'll, he'll be in court. The judge told him to come to court. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not surprised he wasn't here today, but that's up to him. And I guess you, if you can Zoom, you're allowed to Zoom. So, um, but uh, we're getting there. Uh, we have one more date. And uh, I expect that that date will... Uh, bring some relief on a few things uh like me through the mud with the, with these allegations that i was trying to get certain people on the phones at the jail and uh, the judge denied the motion for sanctions there but my motion for sanctions yeah Mello asked for motions for sanctions for and we've talked about it before but um in case you forgot tim bradle and um carney or it was like some some phone call to the jail and he was getting you know he was it was a bunch of people on the call and he was giving like multiple people's names and titles to the prison for like permission to talk to turtle boy on his legal team and he represented someone as a lawyer rather than um a paralegal or something which doesn't give like they would have the same amount of rights at the prison phone to get privileged phone calls at the prison so they would still have privileged phone calls whether you're a lawyer or a paralegal but they just wanted to get tim bradle on something and that's the only thing they could like grasp onto so sanctions we need to sanction him because he misspoke a word and tim bradle didn't know like he's he honestly thought that they were a lawyer and not you know a paralegal but doesn't matter because <laughs> it doesn't change anything so they tried to get him on that against him is still pending and i look forward to yeah, and then they he counter motioned with uh asking for sanctions on ken mello getting some relief on that motion uh, as soon as possible yeah, so what I said to the judge was that we, we feel that uh, the presentation to the grand jury, such as it is, what, we're, what we've been able to figure out, uh, has taken things out of context, uh, has uh, not really presented an accurate picture of what happened. And that's an Odell motion, that the, uh, the integrity of the grand jury, the the, uh, the true nature of the evidence presented was uh, altered, was obfuscated. Not only did they lie about, you know, when he said what things and how they were, you know, to whom they were directed to, but they would also like make up titles to his episodes and like just throw in a bunch of garbage BS evidence that was not true. It's infuriates me. And that should infuriates me. And have you gotten? I, I know there sounds like there was some uh, disagreement in court about whether they've given you the grand jury minutes or not, or to what extent they have, or maybe what they hadn't given you the exhibits. Can you just say, you know, for the record, what yeah. you have? Received, so what you have not? it's hard for a defense counsel to look at grand jury transcripts and figure out if you have a full picture of the events. Um, we know that we don't have the exhibits. There's a there's a pile of exhibits that we don't have. We were able to figure out that much from the grand jury that we do have. 
but uh, we don't know. You know, we don't know what we don't have. Ninety percent. Ninety percent of this case is, uh, is is comments that I made on YouTube, and and they present this stuff to the grand jury, and they say, Sorry. now we're playing episode six twenty three, which is a three hour episode, and we don't know what they played. So we would like to know that, so we know what, what I was indicted for. And, and that's where the bill of particulars comes in, is that that's a, a motion that requires the government to specifically say uh, what part of the uh, uh, of the body of evidence is. Uh, applied to what particular charge, and uh, I'm 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 gratified that the government didn't object to that because we need that in this case uh, in a prosecution that's never happened before for people speaking their mind, people uh, protesting the government, protesting the police, protesting the the prosecution. Uh, that's never been a crime before, so we need to know what are they saying that that Aiden said is a crime. You described uh, the, the uh, discovery that you did receive so far as being kind of like a huge dump of materials that's hard to... Uh, can you say how that differs from how you usually receive discovery? In a yep. case so like so you, have, you have all sorts of things in a case. You have, you have huge files of gigabytes of raw data, you know, uh, phone records, and, and uh, the crime scene department typically takes 500, you know, photos that are very high... Uh, uh, they take up a lot of memory, you know, and you'll get you'll get 500 photos from the crime scene that are duplicative, you know, and you get those things, and you know, you can look at those for five minutes, and it doesn't really tell you much about the case. You know, we need the we need the real meat and potatoes here. We need the grand jury minutes. We need the exhibits to the grand jury, and that's what we will we'll use to take our next steps that we want to take, which are to move to dismiss the case. And at the end there, you said, for the record, this is uh, Mello's third. Uh deadline or something and that's for the discovery like for to, him. Uh, to respond to my cross motion for sanctions that I filed in response to his motion trying to sanction me for for misspeaking about someone's status to the jail can you talk about the status of the restraining order case across the street what's going on with that right looked to me like there was a hearing on the 8th but or at least it was scheduled I didn't see that it happen necessarily this Friday we're moving to take the restraining order um, this Friday. In, uh, Dedham, in Dedham District Court. Okay, Correct. so there'll be a hearing on that on Friday? Or? Yes. Okay. And is that impacting your ability to be in the courtroom? Or? That's the restraining order that the crazy chick that uh, Aiden was involved with got on him uh, for being a witness in this case somehow, some way. But even though she was like actually working for uh or working with ken mellow and brian tully the um uh pro uh investigator the detective or was he a detective i don't know he he heads over um michael proctor he's over michael proctor so yeah so tully and mellow are sitting there texting with the chick that got the restraining order on aiden the night of so that basically this it's entrapment i think that's entrapment because they tried to get him in her house and he didn't want to go in her apartment he was like outside in public i don't want to get into the whole thing anyways but yeah so it was totally entrapment if you're not if you're new to this case and you're just catching on the government is corrupt in Norfolk District County, Massachusetts. <laughs> All right, let's finish this up. What's the, it depends if, if, the, if, if the person with the order shows up, they can essentially use that to evict me from the courthouse, which is why we are filing. We were in jail now. Has. There's been several uh, occasions where uh, the plaintiff in that case has shown up. <laughs> Nobody wants to say her name. <laughs> you know, uh, causes Mr. Carney to have to uh, abide by the order, which is what he wants to do. But, you know, he gets flushed out of places where he wants to be. And I've, and I've been covering the Reed case, obviously. And that happened because he, at one of the latest hearings, he was in the courtroom and she showed up with her restraining order in hand. Basically, the only purpose she was there, she was with the McAlberts. So she was with Gemma Cabe and um, Brian Albert and all of them. That's who she walked in with. And the O'Keefe family who seem to think that the McAlberts are gods or something. I don't know. 
Um, so she walked in like a weapon. They used her as a weapon against Turtle Boy to get him out of the courtroom. And I'm sure they were all just so proud of themselves that day. So proud of themselves. But you know what? Joke's on them because Turtle Boy, <laughs> yeah, Turtle Boy is going to be vindicated and I believe in the end, justice for John O'Keefe will happen after this bogus trial takes place and she is acquitted of the charges. Or the FBI steps in in the middle of the trial and says, okay, okay, we've heard enough. <laughs> Morrissey, you're coming with me. Extensively for the last year, it's my biggest story. Um, that I've ever published, and uh, this individual has never come to court before until the order was issued and it was basically used to take him to the court. So, um, I know previously with Judge Krupp, he, he amended the stay away orders that were in place previously uh, to allow me to cover the care leave here. Is it Judge Krupp or Judge Corrupt? <laughs> it almost sounds like corrupt. Uh, so, if, if any of the people with the orders on me were in there, I could stay in there. So. Uh, We'll see. Happens Friday. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. 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 All right. So that was that. A lot of little updates that um, I thought were important that we should go over before trial begins on Monday. Uh, let me know what you guys think about this case, about Turtle Boys charges, about the Commonwealth. Totally stepping all over the constitution what enrages you about this case or fires you up about this case let me know in the comments below this case has got me so fired up especially what they're doing to aiden or what they have done and continue to do to aiden turtle boy um he's the reason i started this channel he's the reason once he was arrested i knew it was bogus charges as soon as i heard turtle boys arrested i'm like they got him they got him on something and they did it somehow like i know it's bogus and once i started hearing everything i'm like oh my god the commonwealth come on now like totally totally obvious corruption going on here um yeah I, the feds the feds have to step in or we need karen acquitted and then what? I mean, st we still need someone to go after the real people, the real defendants who should be in this case, the Alberts, McCabe's, all of them. So we need to somehow go after them. It's got to be the feds. I really think the feds are giving them the rope to hang themselves. They're going to let this trial take place. They, actually, that's an interesting theory that I heard was are the feds, have the feds already told Karen's team, like, no matter what, you aren't going to be put in prison. We will make sure of it. Let this trial happen. Don't worry about it. You know, continue it through it to the end or you know, until they give themselves enough rope so we can hang ourselves. And I, and, and they're using Yanetti and Jackson to get them to confess or admit their, you know, try impeach them with their wrongdoings and that kind of thing. So it's a possibility. I mean, it could be one of the reasons why they walk in so confidently is because they know that no matter what, the feds aren't going to let her go to prison. And that could be, um, you know, because they're watching and they're waiting for that misstep that Morrissey or Tully or Proctor is going to make so that they can just say, okay, time to go. You're coming with me. I've heard enough. And those char my charges are going to stick on you now. Like maybe they just need that extra, I don't know, because they have everybody's phone, phone records. So uh, maybe they just need, they need more. They need just a little bit more to make the charges 100% stick for these corrupt people. We'll see. 
I hope that's the case. I mean, I would love it if the feds were in on it and saying like, hey, just let this go to go to trial. Don't worry, your client's not going to go to prison. We won't let it happen. And um, we'll, we'll be there in case, you know, whatever happens. But I don't know. It could be far-fetched. It could be a far-fetched dream of mine that, you know, the feds are part of it. Or at least, you know, on the, in the, out, like standing on the outside ready to jump is what I'm hoping is what the feds are doing. That's my, my hope. And with that, I will leave you. Please be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Take care. Bye now. If you've been impacted by a true crime and would like your story told in your own words, or if you or someone you know has been wrongfully convicted or accused of a crime, please write to crimeincourtchannel at gmail.com and tell us your real true crime encounters. Thanks for watching.